This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less tax. This is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So <clears throat> we all depend on ranchers and farmers for food. What we don't always understand is the risks and the rewards of ranching and farming, and either from a financial standpoint or from a uh, tax standpoint. And uh, I talk about it in my uh, new book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, but we're really going to get deep into ranching today because we have a literally daughter, granddaughter, great-granddaughter of ranchers, um, Casey Atkinson with us today. And Casey, it is just absolutely delightful to have you here. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm always excited to get to meet new people and, and have conversations about the world that I live in. So, so, so tell us, um, so if, if you would share, you know, your family history when it comes to ranching. Yeah, so my family's been involved in agriculture for a really long time. In fact, part of the ranch that we operate on today, my great grandfather homesteaded uh, back in 1895. He was there for a few years before he got around to homesteading it. So we have been in the same place for a really long time. Um, my great great grandfather brought his family over and, and got started in the agriculture business. And so, you know, we have a long history of being involved. We started way back when in the sheep business, um, eventually decided sheep were not meant for this country uh, with all the predators that we have. And so switched over into the cattle business and we've, we're still here. We're still going and, and doing this. And so I'm very proud and excited to be the fourth generation on the same land doing the same thing that my great grandfather did. That, that's amazing. Yeah. So that's why we, we, we get our sheep from New Zealand, right? Cause they don't have the predators. <laughs> Well, I mean, we do still have a pretty vibrant sheep industry here in America, just not so much in uh, this part of Wyoming anymore. But and yeah, where, we do where, get... and where exactly are you in Wyoming? So I live in in southeast Wyoming. If anyone has ever heard of Laramie Peak, it's kind of a giant mountain in the middle of nowhere. But that's pretty much where I call home. Awesome. So I want to. I, I I think most of us. So most of our viewers are entrepreneurs, investors, they're interested in that. But I think very few people really understand agriculture at all. Um, uh, I think we understand a little bit more about real estate, business and energy, things like that. But I don't think we have a whole lot of background anymore in agriculture. So um, I want to talk about a little bit of kind of what you go through. I mean, you right now, I know you're going through a busy time right now, really appreciate you taking time out from what you're doing. But can you kind of kind of walk us through a year um, in the uh, cattle ranching business? So of course, depending on where you are, everyone's year is going to look a little bit different. You know, seasons don't necessarily line up. Some people calve in the fall, we calve in the spring. Um, I think I told you before, before we got started two days ago, it still looked like January um, out my front door. We are still deep in winter. This is probably uh, the harshest winter we've had, you know, in my lifetime in terms of it certainly putting down a lot of snow and, and staying. Normally we have green grass and bare ground like the rest of the world seems to have right now, but we were still buried in snow. So, you know, kind of typical year, if you start in January, January, February, most of March, we're just feeding cows. Um, you know, taking care of them, making sure we're meeting their nutritional <laughs> needs. That's about all we can get done with the snow that we have on the ground. We will start calving um, our very first calf heifers, usually the end of March. Our cows start calving in April. That's what we're doing right now. We're, we're trying to make sure they're not having them in snow banks and we can keep them alive and, and get them going. Um, and so we will calve our cow herd primarily in April and May. June, um, and of course you're fixing fence and irrigating and all of this stuff while you're calving cows. It's a very busy season. June is really focused on irrigation, um, trying to raise our hay crop. We live at about 7,500 feet, so I've got a whole about 28 days worth of a growing season here um, oh, wow. where I live, and so I have a very short window to try to raise whatever hay crop I'm going to raise to try and get as much hay 
you know, put up ourselves so we don't have to buy it. That's a major expense that we have to the ranch if we have to buy additional feed to get them through the winter. Um, so June, we're trying to raise that hay crop. July and early August, we're going to harvest that hay crop and, and get it up and stored for winter. Um, when we roll into fall, it's trying to catch up on any building projects. If you want to replace fence or fix pipelines or, you know, kind of do that stuff. You're also kind of focused on getting your cows pregnancy tested because you don't want to keep the ones that aren't going to have a calf. They're not paying for themselves, so they need to go um, and, and that kind of stuff. And really just trying to get yourself prepared again for winter, which can arrive in October um, again where, where I am. So, you know, winter can be a really long season. And so that's kind of just the, the high points of what we do, of course. We can be busy every day. There's always more work to be done on a ranch, I think, than you can conceivably get done. But those are kind of the major seasons that we roll through here. So, so at what point do you um, uh, fatten the calves and get them ready for a market? So we actually don't do that here. So okay. most of the ranching industry, if you're talking about the cattle industry, is broken into three segments. So you are either a cow-calf producer, you're a a stalker, backgrounder, or you're a feeder. And so it takes between 18 months and 24 months to roll an animal clear through that process. So we are cow-calf. We get, you know, we have the herd of mama cows that we're running here on the ranch, and we keep those mama cows as long as they're productive for 10 years um, before we'll, we'll send them off to somebody who lives in a kinder climate or they will enter the beef chain themselves. But we really, we focus on raising calves up to about 500 pounds for the first six months of their life. And then we sell them to the second phase. Um, so we'll have them roughly from April to October. In October, they'll go to their second owner, who will be the stalker backgrounder. They'll keep them from where, somewhere between six to 12 months, probably. And they will put additional weight on them, usually through grazing them. Um, they try not to put a lot of feed resources into them other than what mo Mother Nature provides in, in terms of grass resources. And then they will sell them somewhere around, you know, 12, 15 months, usually probably 15 to 18 months to their final owner, which is the feeder, uh, which is the fat cattle we think of that you then put on those final pounds, that final fat layer, which makes beef taste so delicious um, before they're then going to go to the harvester um, to end up on your dinner plate. Wow. That's, that, that's quite a process. So um, it, it sounds to me, so I'm just going to, let's look at your particular aspect of this uh, ranching business. I just have always thought it sounds like a lot of, you've got a lot of risks in your business. Can you kind of walk through some of the challenges that you that that a that a typical cattle rancher is going to run into in an on a yearly basis when it comes to what types of things you have to watch out for, what types of things could cause problems for you, um, in, as far as the cattle themselves. Absolutely. So risks are plentiful. Um, I think people in agriculture, especially in life, we joke that we're just in the business of breaking even, right? Like that's yeah. our goal which is not most people's goal. Most people's goal is to make money. Ours is just to stay afloat. Um, so, you know, there's there are so many risks. First of all, you have risks from Mother Nature. I think hopefully we all kind of remember Storm Atlas, which hit South Dakota a few years ago and wiped out massive numbers of cattle. My great-grandfather actually went broke and lost the ranch back in 1919. There was a massive blizzard that came through and wiped out every last one of his sheep. Um, and so he ended up going broke after that. And so we, we constantly deal with mother nature in terms of, you know, we can't fight her. So you have to try and work with her, but sometimes you can't work with her. Um, you know, we, we lost a few calves early on just a week ago because we got nailed with another blizzard. And like I said, it still looks like January here. So we, we just didn't have anywhere to go or, or any way to do that. So you've got mother nature, um, either she's blizzarding on you in, in my case, or she's drowning you out. The past three years, we've actually been in a pretty significant drought. And so, you know, trying to have the feed resources available to maintain your cattle herd, you know, you're not raising your own hay crop. So you're having to buy hay to feed them. That's a major expense. And so those are certainly risks. Um, you've got market risks that you have to deal with. What's 
the market going to be like? We don't really get to set the price for our cattle. We don't get to tell you what you're going to pay for it. The stalker backgrounder comes in and tells me what my cattle are worth. And basically, I just have to take it. And so I don't really have any control over how much money I'm going to get for the product that I have produced and whether that's going to pay my bills or not. Um, some years it does. We figure in a 10 year cycle, three years, you're going to lose money. Three years, you might make money. In four years, you're going to break even. And so the goal over that 10-year period is just to manage the years that you made a little money to counteract the years that you know you're going to lose money so that you can break even all 10 years across the board. Um, last year, we had problems. We had a, a disease outbreak that we've never had before. We had something called diphtheria, which is something we've never had to contend with in our cattle before. And we lost, you know, 20% of our calf crop. Well, that's just... 20% of my income that all of a sudden went away overnight. And I still have all of the expenses coming in because I still have all of those cows, right? It didn't affect the cows. It just affected the calves. And so, you know, there's always something it seems like that you have to contend with. I think most of us hope that once in a lifetime, we're going to have a good market. We're going to have a good calf crop and mother nature's going to be kind to us all in the same year. And so you're going to have just this one, you know, super bright spot where everything really just came together for you. And so there's there's definitely risks um, associated with this industry that you have to be cognizant of and you really have to be managing for all the time and kind of trying to prepare yourself for when those bad scenarios hit to make sure that you're going to be able to get through them. So, so have you had challenges over the years with insects, with um, disease in the, in the hay itself? So um, those types of problems. So it's not just the cattle, but it's also the feed. You know, I would say we are so high and we are so cold for so long. We probably don't run into the typical insect problems that you might have, like say on the crop side, but we do occasionally have a really bad grasshopper crop. And a grasshopper crop can come in and wipe out a significant amount of the forage resources that you have. Like you could start thinking, oh, we're going to be really set. And then a massive crop of grasshoppers comes in and eats, you know, half of the forage resources that you have available. And so that's probably from an insect perspective, you know, mostly what we have to deal with. Um, whereas in different climates, if you were in the South, if you were somewhere hotter or more humid, you're obviously obviously going to have different insect problems we don't have here. We have not had, thankfully, knock on wood, um, any issues in terms of, you know, disease or whatnot in our, our hay crops, um, thankfully. But again, other than the grasshoppers eating it or elk, I think that's another thing that mm. people probably don't think of. We're not only responsible for managing our livestock, I'm also responsible for managing all of this significant wildlife population that we have, deer, yeah. antelope, elk, bears, mountain lions, you know, whatnot. And so we, we have a pretty significant loss in terms of the elk coming in and eating a bunch of our crop before we're able to harvest it and get it up um, where we can protect it. And so we just kind of have to factor that in as well that you know the elk are going to come through and they're either going to smash it to the ground so you can't get it up or they're going to eat it one or the other <laughs> wow so are you um so uh how many head of cattle do you typically have and and what acreage do you um have them on so we run a herd of about 400 head of cows um we have shrunk that back some because of the drought we haven't been able to run as many but um, we definitely keep busy and and I live in Wyoming. So where I live, it takes about 40 acres to run every single cow that we have, which would be wildly different than say West Virginia, where maybe you can run a single cow to an acre. Um, so we run on really close to about 16,000 acres. Um, so it's for most people, they would consider that a, a fairly significant size operation uh, to manage and, and take care of. But you know, where we are, we just have to have that much land to manage the cows that we have. And and then do you have um, a lot of regulations, particularly with regards to like the mountain lions and the bears and the, and, and the elk and so forth. When you talk about managing the wildlife, um, I presume that you have uh, certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. I mean, largely it's really just going to be focused around what's the legal hunting season. 
um, you know, to come in and try and do some population control, you know, to hunt anything, you have to have a license. There's a certain amount, um, you know, there's a, a specific time in which you could harvest those animals. You know, if you're talking about mountain lions and bears, there's a limit, a quota on how many of those can be harvested in a year before the season closes, whether, you know, the time has elapsed or not. And so, you know, for us, it's, it's more about probably hunters coming in than us personally doing any, any sort of population control. We just, you just learn to deal with them, right? You just learn to, to manage with them um, because you, you have them. And so they're, they're a part of the natural landscape around here. And, and for the most part, we enjoy having them around. Maybe not the elk, they destroy a lot of fence along with the, the hay crop, but you know, we love having the deer. We love ha having the antelope and, and different things that kind of diversity around. And so um, just trying to make sure that you, you've left plenty of, of forage for them to be able to consume as well uh, when you take your cows out of a place and whatnot is it's important to consider that too. So outside of mother nature, what, um, what would you consider the biggest risk to, uh, to a ranch or the ranching industry? You know, I think something that's, very different for say even my dad's generation right he's he just turned 79 in january and it's he and i you know on the ranch just the two of us managing all of this and taking care of this i came home six years ago uh full time on the ranch we unfortunately uh lost my brother unexpectedly he was the one who was going to be coming home to the family ranch to take over and and when we lost him i decided that i needed to come home and and step wow. up and step into this and whatnot. But, you know, I think for the older generation, they lived for a really long time in this place where you just did what you needed to do. You knew how to do it. You did what you needed to do. People just went to the grocery store and bought beef and were happy to have it on their plate. Well, we now live in this world of social media where information is transmitted instantly, where bad information could get transmitted much quicker, it seems like, than factual, solid information. And so now we kind of operate in this place where we almost need what we call a social license to operate, right? We have to have the public on our side, but we have a public that is many generations removed from the family farmer ranch. Right. We don't know a farmer or rancher to ask their questions to. They're getting their information from the latest Netflix documentary because surely if it's on Netflix, it must be the truth. Um, you know, or they're listening to what's on their Facebook feed or, you know, uh, something that comes across the evening news, which unfortunately in most cases is not real accurate or not real factual. And so I think one of the biggest risks that we have now is how do we combat this snowstorm? really of misinformation of fear mongering that's happening because it's an interesting dichotomy right when you pull the public and you ask them who do you trust farmers and ranchers are one of the only groups of people that end up on the positive side of that scale that we still have the public trust and yet they're not necessarily coming to us for their information if they have questions about how their food is raised probably because they can't find us or they don't know us um, and so, you know, in order for us to continue to be able to make the decisions that we know are the right ones to make, um, because we understand how livestock work, we understand animal husbandry, we understand the land, we understand how crops grow, um, we really do need to kind of address their fears and their concerns so they will allow us to continue doing what we need to do. Um, you know, California, I think, is a prime example with all of the propositions that have been passed in California, where they've maybe lost faith in the people raising their food. And so they make all of these decisions that may or may not be in the best interest of, of raising food. But because they don't know, they pass these laws that then we have to contend with. And so I think for us, that's certainly a big risk moving forward that we have to be prepared to kind of address head on. So, so I'm curious, just um, what what are probably the top two or three pieces of misinformation that if you got to correct it to a large group of public, which is uh, our podcast, what would you what would you say? What would you like to what would you like to correct out there? Oh, I like to you know, I think the first one, obviously, is we get hammered a lot from an environmental perspective, right? And methane emissions. Yep. Well, 
methane emissions from ruminant animals are not new. We had buffalo in this country for hundreds of years that were ruminant animals that were emitting the exact same methane that my cattle are emitting today. So my cattle aren't adding methane to the atmosphere. They're helping actually recycle it. Methane breaks down in 10 to 15 years. They graze plants, which encourages those plants to pull that carbon back out of the atmosphere and to store it underground, um, to spread out, to grow, to diversify, all of those good things. And so it's part of this cycle that has been ongoing for hundreds and hundreds of years. What is new is humans, right? And their carbon emissions, electricity, burning fossil fuels and transportation. We waste 40 percent of the food that we produce in this country it ends up in a landfill well when food rots in a landfill it also creates methane mm -hmm. that is methane that didn't used to go into the atmosphere and so you know understanding where these additional greenhouse gas emissions come from um and it's not my cows i think would be one yes. one important thing uh the university of florida did this cool study where they found that you could eat beef for almost 40 years for the same environmental impact as using your cell phone for one year and I was raised before cell phones were a thing. So I do know that we can, in fact, live without them, even though we don't think so. But, you know, using your cell phone for a single year, 40 years worth of eating beef, you know. And so I think ad addressing that's important. I think another myth that I would like to probably do away with is this idea that agriculture is becoming corporatized. Um, the truth is that 98 percent of all farms and ranches in this country are family owned and family oh, wow. run. Um, and I think that's something that gets lost, right? Like people think big is bad. Well, I'm the definition of big by most people's standards, right? The average cow size in this country is only 25 head. It's small producers. It's people who are retired. They're doing it on the side in addition to a full-time job. But most of the beef in this country is still produced by people like me, right? Even though there's not as many of us that are large scale, we're still producing most of the beef, but it's me and dad. Right. Like right. out there every day. And my mom, not a big corporation. It's, it's not Monsanto. It's not Monsanto, but yet on paper, we're an LLC, right? Because in order you need to, to pass, protect yourself. Yep. To pass it on and protect ourselves, we have to be. And so I think people confuse the fact that we've tried to do appropriate estate planning to protect ourselves, to make sure that this operation can transition from, you know, my grandparents to my dad or from my dad to me, as somehow being a, a corporate entity. And no, it's it's still just me. And so if you're gonna trust me, if you're gonna believe what I have to say and you're gonna follow me on social media and I'm gonna show you the good, the bad, the ugly, my day, so that you can see firsthand how I'm raising and caring for these animals, then you, know, you have to accept that I'm also big, right? But I'm not bad. And I'm also technically a corporation because I'm an LLC, but I'm still just a family, but but and you're not so real, think, you're not really big. So I mean that's the thing. I mean you know this is this is where I think there's a huge disconnect uh, right now in the public. It's like we want to tax the rich, but when they talk about tax the rich, a lot of times they talk about well we're going to tax people that make five hundred thousand dollars a year because they're rich, and I'm going mm, they're not. Okay, yeah. but five hundred thousand dollars a year if you know if you have a lot of obligations. It, it, to me, that's not rich. Now, ten million dollars a year—that's rich, okay? Right. But but there's a this misnomer between what's big and what's not big, what's rich, what's not rich. But one of the things that so so you bring up estate planning. It's one of the things you and I have in common. We both talk about estate planning um, for kind of sort of different reasons. But I'm a very I'm a big fan of um, I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship, small business, family farms, etc. Can you talk about what you see as the threat of, um, of like estate tax and some of these wealth taxes that have been proposed? Um, I know there's uh, there's been a lot of discussion, particularly from the senator um, next to you in Montana, uh, that has been really pushing back against his own party uh, about these uh, estate taxes and wealth taxes for ranching, for ranching and farming. So can you talk about the the threat that that kind of um, policy has on uh, family ranches? You know, I think for years now, we have been in this situation. I can't tell you how many 
family ranches I've seen go to the auction block because they were still a sole proprietorship. There was no, you know, formal structure to try to protect them. There was no estate planning done. And then when, you know, the grandpa or the dad or whoever passes away, the son or the daughter or whoever, grandchildren, was there working the ranch with the intention of continuing it, can't pay the tax bill that's due to the government. Because one of the things that we have seen is land prices have become astronomical, right? And so when you look at the value, say, of our ranch from an agricultural perspective, it is much less than its value as a wealthy person's paradise, right? right? A hunting a hunting sanctuary or whatnot. But when it comes time to pay that tax bill, they're not going to value it at its agriculture value, right? They're going to value highest, it at market value. Right. Highest and best highest, use. That's the rule. Well, it's suddenly going to become worth millions of dollars. And did you hear me say I'm trying to break even? Like yeah. I don't, I don't have money in the bank. And so if you don't have large life insurance policies or some way to navigate that tax bill and you don't have a structure to protect yourself, most people are faced with no choice but to sell out. They cannot hold on to it. They have to sell the land to pay the tax bill. So, so here, not- here's what who do they sell to? Well, it's it's usually in our case, like whenever anybody sells out around here, it ends up being a wealthy multimillionaire who wants it for hunting, you know, and maybe they'll lease the ground out to a neighbor, somebody to run some cattle on. But the ownership is not typically someone who's going to have the intention to keep it in agriculture. And that should be a concern to most people. Right. We already know Mm. how many. There's no more land in this country, right? That is a finite resource. And we know that we are losing hundreds of acres every single day of good quality cropland to grow crops on, not necessarily ranching land, but cropland in particular to urban development. They're putting up parking lots and malls and housing developments and whatnot. And so when you're taking this land out of agriculture and you think about how many people we have and how many people you need us to feed, we need to feed you. Well, I've got to have a certain amount of land to be able to do that. And so, you know, figuring out ways, I think it's so important that we work towards. And I mean, yes, I'm biased, but I want, I would really like it if you would help me stay in business through good tax policy and understand that I'm not rich. You know, I'm rich on paper only, and that's it. The only way that I can become rich is to actually convert my assets and sell them off. I don't have that cash sitting in the bank um, to be able to manage these large, these large tax bills. And so, you know, the, the death taxes, we call it estate Mm -hmm. taxes are something that, you know, there are certain things that we can do. I'm always astounded by the number of people in agriculture who don't have an estate plan. Far more do not have than do. And then they end up in these horrible situations where the kids have to to sell out or, you know, everybody wants paid out. If you have multiple kids in a family and only one wants to come home and the rest, you know, how do you pay them out? How do you navigate that? And so there's a lot of issues that a good estate plan is so important to protect yourself if you intend to stay in the agriculture industry and keep ranching or keep farming. Well, so let me, so, so let's go to how important uh, maintaining that agricultural land is. Um, have you have you calculated how much? Ma- so first of all, how much beef does the average American consume in a year? Oh, I should know this. It's somewhere. I want to say it's somewhere in the fifty pound range per okay. year. Is okay. How much so average- so so how many? So if they if it's fifty pounds, and then how many people are you feeding a year? So I should know this as well. I want to say that the number is somewhere around 170, that each one of us feeds somewhere around 170 people on average across across the board, which is significantly more than even in the 1970s. It was, you know, much less than that. So we're we're constantly, and as the population grows, right, that number continues right. to increase. 
um, because it has to, because, you know, we used to say we represented 2% of the population in America. We now represent 1.5% oh, wow. of the population in America. And I suspect in another decade or two, we're going to represent 1% of the population in America. So we have no choice but to figure out how to get better and how to do more with less, with less land, with less resources, with less availability, because the population in America is going to continue to grow. Likely, we are going to continue to decrease. And so how do you how do you manage that? Well, you have to get more efficient with what you have. You have to be able to produce more with less all of the time through research and technology improvements and and managing what you have more effectively. So, so the big, um, so, so the two big um, words, catchphrases in uh, agriculture right now seem to be sustainability and organic. So, can you kind of, can you kind of educate us just a little bit on those two and what that means to you? You know, if you ask anybody, I think in agriculture, if they're sustainable, right? My dad would say, "Well, we've been here for a hundred and." 30, 40 years. So clearly we're sustainable, right? We, we have endured and we have continued. But I think there's so much more that goes into it from the public perspective. It's more than just enduring. And I think part of the reason we in agriculture, we hear the word sustainable and kind of our hackles go up a little bit, right? Because we think that that has to mean something big and flashy and fancy, and you're using some cutting edge technology and and, and it's not, it's the little decisions that we make every single day to make us more sustainable. We've, we have installed in the past probably 30 years over 10 miles worth of pipelines across different parts of the ranch so that we can utilize the pastures more efficiently because cattle are only gonna graze where there's close access to water. And so where there was no water available, the cattle weren't grazing there. Well, by providing water to those places, I can now use my pastures more efficiently. That allows me to be more sustainable. As research comes along or disease patterns change, am I making changes to my animal health protocols and making sure that I am giving my cattle the best you know, vaccines available to help protect them against those things? That's making me more sustainable, right? Those are little decisions that I'm making every single day that I don't maybe think about in terms of sustainability, but I would argue they are absolutely, you know, working us towards being more sustainable um, in the long run. And so, you know, sustainability has to include the environment. It has to include your animals, but it also has to include you too, right? There's a very real, in order to be sustainable, you have to be able to stay in business. Right. And so, you know, can we do something to, improve cattle prices? Can we do something to improve the death tax situation? All of those things working together, I think, um, make, make us certainly more sustainable. And what was the second word? You Orga organic. Organic. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think organic has a place, but I also think organic has kind of taken on this life where people don't really understand what it means, it's merely a growing practice that doesn't necessarily make it better than conventional or traditional. Um, it certainly isn't safer. I would, I, I will say that uh, I probably will take some hits that I don't even believe it's necessarily healthier. Um, because I think that those of us who are doing things in the, the traditional sense or conventional sense, we are still using the best research and the best technology that we have available that has been proven safe, that has been proven effective to get a product to you that we would serve to our family every day of the week and twice on Sundays, right? Um, so we stand behind what we're doing. And so I think organic has just sort of become this sort of trendy buzzword. But at the end of the day, I need people to understand it's, it's just a growing practice. And if that's something that makes you feel good about eating your food and you can afford it, I'm all for it. But don't feel like because you can't afford it because it is more expensive that what you're serving your family is any less nutritional, it's any less safe, it's any less healthy um, because it's at the end of the day, it is just kind of a label and it's a choice of growing practice. I, I love it. So thank you. So so in my book, um, When When Wealth Strategy, I talk about uh, the tax benefits. And I uh, and the reason I'm saving this for last is because um the I mean, I I've 
been in the tax business for 40 years and had um, ranchers and farmers as clients. And I, I do know that the, the tax laws are very, the income tax laws are very favorable to, to ranchers and farmers. But there's a reason for this, and that is you're in it to break even. And anybody else who breaks even doesn't have to pay tax. And so, and, and there, I do think there's also a, a, not just a, an incentive. We need the agriculture to grow food, but we need to be growing our own food as opposed to importing food. Um, so my last question to you is how important do you see it from a controlling what we eat, controlling what we can do to be producing agriculture in the U S as opposed to importing it from other countries? So, you know, I'm obviously I think it's important to maintain a growing system so that you you have food. Right. I think that's important. Learning how to garden, have a rooftop garden, grow some lettuce hydroponically on your wall, whatever. Um, but I do think in America, imports are also very important. Um, and I think this is something that a lot of people in the cattle industry don't understand. As a producer, so we import less than 10%. It's like 9.3% of the beef that we consume in this country, we import. But oh. we import 90% of it is what we call lean trim. So here in America, we eat overwhelmingly ground beef. We are a ground beef nation. Last time I checked, ground beef is one of the lowest value cuts of beef that exist, right? People eat it because it's cheap. We are not a steak eating nation. And yet, because we have this feed yard system, we are creating the highest quality steak on earth, in my opinion. And it's the highest value cut of beef. So I am producing something overwhelmingly that you aren't eating. So I need a market for it, right? I don't want to grind up my ribeyes and my T-bones and feed you ground beef because I have then slashed the value of what my cattle are worth like that. And I, I can't live on less money, right? I'm already breaking even. So I can't lose value in my carcass. So I need to have export markets for that product. I need to be able to send my steak primarily to Asia, to Japan, to Korea, to Singapore, to all of these places that are steak eating nations and love our steak because I'm getting a premium for that and then because in our feed yard system, we are at best producing what would create a 50-50 hamburger blend, 50% lean, 50% steak. Well, when you go to the grocery store, you don't find less than 80-20. Right. And most of you are eating 90-10 or 93-7 because you want that leaner ground beef. Well, a, a fat steer can't provide that to you. You're getting that out of our coal cows, our coal bulls, the dairy industry. Um, so I, I can't even produce in this system the ground beef that you want to eat. So I have to import in that lean trim. I have to in order to be able to feed you and to maintain the value of my cattle. Um, every calf, 500 pound calf that I sell off the ranch, about $100 that they are worth, you know, let's say they're worth a thousand bucks off the ranch in a dream world, right? $100 of that 10% of their value is strictly derived off of what their export value is going to be down the road. Mm. I can't lose that. I can't lose that $100 for export value, and I can't lose the value in grinding them up into beef. So, so into it's very beef. important that you've got that commerce going back and forth is what you're saying between the countries. Mm -hmm. You're exporting what's good for the other countries, what they need. I can, I can, speak, I can attest to that. I've spent years in Europe, and okay. their steak is not nearly as good as our steak, um, it's just not. And they don't even know how to cut the steak right. So they can't butcher it right. So uh, seriously, if you're gonna have steak, you want it to be, you know, I, you know, either it's gonna be the, the, the really expensive steak in Japan, or it's gonna be, you know, something that you get in the United States. So thank you very much, um, Casey. I wish we could go on and on and on because I love this conversation. I'm such a big fan of, of uh, um, American business. In, in particular, but particularly the family um, owned business. I grew up, I'm also the son, grandson, great grandson of entrepreneurs, just not in ranching, we other businesses. And so I'm a huge fan. I do think that 
what happens is when we put the small business out, the big business comes in. And whether it's the wealthy landowner or whether it's the Monsanto or Cargill of the world, they're going to come in because that's what that's what your options are. And uh, it's, it's just impossible. So I'm um, looking forward to more conversations actually with you, Casey, about uh, how actually I would love to help you with the estate planning side, because I do think that that's some education that could be hugely valuable to continuing the family farm and the family ranch and, and making sure, because it's so easy. Once, once you understand it, it's so easy to do. And uh, we just need to get that education out. So thank you so much. So Casey, if we want, I, I know you do a, a lot of speaking. So if we want to know, learn more about what you're doing, where would we go? So the two best ways to find me, one, I have a website, which is caseyatkinson.com. Um, and I'm sure you'll link that for them so they know how Absolutely. to spell my name. And then I also, if you are on social media and you want to see what a day in the life of ranching in the absolute middle of nowhere, Wyoming is like, um, I'd love to have you follow me on Instagram. And my handle is at 10 miles past nowhere. It's one zero for the 10 miles past nowhere. Cause that pretty much describes where I live. So that's awesome. Um, and, and I love having conversations with anybody who has questions about what we're doing, why we're doing it, is your food safe, you know, whatever questions you have, I, I would love to have that conversation with you. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, everybody, for um, uh, watching, listening this. This is so important. And just remember, you know, agriculture is an alternative investment that you, you might want to consider. You might want to consider working with a family farmer. You might always have wanted, you retire, you sell your business. You want to you want to start a family farm. I have a friend who just started a ranch up in actually Wyoming. Um, I may have to connect connect you connect him with you because you know way more than he does, and uh, he's he just started a cattle ranch. So um, very excited about this agriculture, as I think it's such in, such so important to the, our country, and uh, and it's such an opportunity for investment that we don't always think of, and when we do. You know, when we do look at these other ways and the things that the government incentivizes, we're always going to make way more money and pay way less tax. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.